Besides being a food writer and the presenter of BBC Two's Cooking in the Danger Zone, Stephen Gates has a stranger claim to fame. At age four, he appeared on the controversial album cover of Led Zeppelin's 1973 album, Houses of the Holy. Now, for the first time, he sets out to discover its story and to confront his own mixed emotions about it in Stephen Gates' cover story. I'm on my way to Northern Ireland to revisit the scene of one of the most uh, notorious and famous album covers of all time, Led Zeppelin's Houses of the Holy. The photo was shot in 1972 at the height of the Troubles and it features naked children with blonde hair and very silvery skin climbing up the giant's causeway uh, towards an apocalyptic orange sky and there are two children on the cover Um, one of them is Sam Gates at the age of seven and the other is Stephen Gates at the age of four and that's me I'm Stephen Gates it's a photo that's followed me around for my entire life and that I find oddly disturbing I want to try and find out the story behind the photo and to discover what the whole thing means. And maybe lay a few demons to rest, maybe resurrect some others, I don't know. But it feels like it's a journey that I've, I've been leading to for, for, for my life, ever since I was aware that the photo was around. We're just about to land at Belfast Airport and the clouds seem to have closed in a little bit, despite the fact the captain said it was going to be blue sky here. And um, I can feel my heartbeat getting faster already. Oh, God. Before I go to the Giant's Causeway, I want to try and find out as much as I can about the album cover. And there's another person in, in that photo, and that's my older sister, Sam. And we did lots of child modelling together when we were kids. So I've come to find out her memories of it, and I'm hoping that she remembers a lot more about it than I do. So this is uh, the Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy album cover. Yeah, it's a double album cover, which has basically got lots of naked children climbing over the Giant's Causeway in Ireland, climbing up towards what looks like a sort of nuclear glow, um, orange and yellow and white nuclear glow at the top. And all of the children, all of the naked children, are me and you. Yeah, and we're, we're, our hair looks like golden flax. It's, um, it's got a strange glow to it, and, and it's all been hand-tinted. And you can't see any faces. It's all from, they're all from the back. So you can only see the back of our heads and the back of our bodies. Yeah. And just looking on here, actually, it says 1973. So I was eight and you must have been five, which is exactly the age my kids are now. Yeah. What do you remember of the photo being taken? I, actually, I remember a lot because I remember a very long journey. I remember it being very, very cold. And I remember when we got there, it being ra- it raining. And... Um, and I remember being completely amazed that we were then being expected to strip off and <laughs> climb over the rocks. I was completely baff- I remember being completely baffled by that, and I-, I think it was actually a new one on me. Have you ever thought, Mum, why why did you get me to pose naked for an album cover? Yeah, I have thought that. I thought I've thought it's quite. I have thought it's quite strange. But it was kind of one of those things that, that uh, there was a lot of nakedness in the 70s, I think. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm sure there were lots of sort of sinister bits of nakedness involving children, but I, but I don't think these ones were. I don't think this was. You know, this was, you know, it was a, another, model, another modelling job that was, you know, probably came a week after doing a fairy liquid commercial. So, yes, it was probably quite different, I suppose. <laughs> Mummy, why are your hands so soft to getting your kit off in the <laughs> Giant's Causeway? But, but again, it... <laughs> just didn't feel it didn't feel nasty it didn't feel strange yeah. uh, but i i have a slightly different attitude to it i i'm i am i think a bit scared of it not mm. it's hard hard to explain really it's not something that that it, it, it doesn't affect my life in a in some deep bad way but mm. it's just something i find 
I find it very difficult to understand the photo. And I do feel that there's, there's something bad in there. You know that... But do you, do you mean that? Do you think there's something bad in there from the point of view that's got naked children on it, or the point of view that it's a sort of, you know, village of the damned, or something sort of that kind of? Weird? The, 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 what, what's weird is that it's a whole bundle of things, and I can't mm. seem to unpick it. Mm. There's there's the sense that I'm, you know, there's our bums, you know, mm. and lots of them as well. There's I think there's we're twelve of us there because uh, it's a multiple exposure image. Um, so we're naked, we're kids, uh, you know, and I know that this is from a different time, so that's sort of mm. okay. But it's also the apocalyptic nature of the image. You know, is, is, are these kids sort of going off to the slaughter? Are they, are they going off to heaven? And and then and then there's also this idea that that it has become this um, iconic photo mm. that I have no control over. You know, I sort of feel that I don't know something sort of stolen in a way that. That, um, that there's this big bad thing out there and it's got me on it. Do you know, I think that's... I think you're just... <laughs> I think you're overreacting, Lev. <laughs> Get a grip. <laughs> I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it seems that my sister isn't anywhere near as affected by the photo as I am. I'm beginning to wonder if I'm if I'm just being melodramatic and pathetic and a bit too theatrical about it, but I still feel that it's it's had a, a really marked effect on me that it's sort of sort of damaged me in some little way. Um, but the one thing that we both agreed on was that we we wouldn't dream of letting our kids do the same thing. We'd never let our kids um, undress and and pose in front of a camera. So I'm now driving through the rain on a cloudy, freezing cold January morning. Um, and I'm in Milton Keynes. I'm on my way to go and see my mum um, to find out um, a bit more about how the photo was taken, why, why she let us do it, and also to try and piece together um, what happened on the day of the photo so that maybe I can kind of get to grips with it a little bit more. Just got home. <laughs> Come in. Sit down. Would you like some tea or coffee? Um, yeah, lovely tea. Okay. Um, so, how's the holy then? Was it was it a shocking photo at the time? It didn't occur to me at all that it was shocking. It was other people that then said, "Oh, how can you let the Jews do things like that?" Well, even even back in the seventies, yeah. they, they said that. Yeah. And what did you say? Oh, I didn't even think of it. It's just two children climbing up the rocks, which they enjoyed. It wasn't a sort of thing, oh, you're going to take your coat, clothes off, you're, or you're going to be ru- rude or anything. Mm. It was just, you take your clothes off, so what? <laughs> See, what's, what's weird it is... It meant absolutely nothing to you taking your clothes off. You know, apart from, I wasn't saying to you put them on, you'll be cold. Which is what a normal family mother would have been in the cold October day. Mm. Do you think that photo could be taken now? No, wouldn't be allowed to be. Why do you think that? You can't show naked children anymore. And what, do you think that's... I think it's stupid. Why is that? Well, it's natural, isn't it? Your children take their clothes off. Children like to be free. I, I, don't, th- I don't find that offensive. And it, I didn't at the time it came out. I don't think I'd let Daisy and Poppy do something like that these days, but then maybe I'm in a different world, I guess. I think you probably are. Yeah. Well, the world's moved on, hasn't it? See, for me, the photo... I find the photo really quite disturbing. It's its like some vision of the apocalypse or, or something. Well, that's what it was meant to be in their eyes. But you but you reckon it's an optimistic photo rather than a yeah, pessimistic one? Yeah, I think one. so. Hmm. Yeah, for me, it sort of... It, it's, it summons up something that... Not... I don't know. Why do you think I would find it really quite upsetting? I think it's because it's you... If it was if it was other children, I don't think it would be. You just look at it and think, oh, well, that's it. Yeah, I just feel like I'm in the middle of some hellish scene there, and um, you know, I can assure does you that... you weren't at the time. No, I'm not. I'm not saying <laughs> yeah. that at all. I'm, I'm just, uh, but, but as an image, as, yeah. as as a as a symbol of something, it's it's it seems to be something quite scary, something that that sort of follows me around a little bit, and and because it's such a famous yeah. image that you know, it's it has some otherworldly significance. You know, it's taken on a, a life of its own in some way. Yeah, I agree with that. I didn't really want to tackle my mum on it. I didn't want her to, didn't want to um, to accuse her of something. I didn't want to, to, her to to feel that 
I thought she was doing something terrible by letting her kids, you know, strip off naked in front of a camera. It, it is a bit weird that she let us do that, but it was a different time, so, you know, I wasn't there to accuse her of it. I felt a little bit like I was, you know, treading on glass and that, and that I shouldn't um, seem like I was being too aggressive about it. But, um, yeah, still, still a few holes in the uh, world of the House of the Holy Cover that, that need to be filled in. I'm on a very pretty little suburban street in West London and um, I'm finally about to meet Aubrey Powell who is the photographer who took the photo on the cover of House of the Holy and I'm quite anxious actually. Um, Okay, let's do it. I'm so Long time, I know you are. How are you? Good to see (laughs) you. I, I haven't seen well. you since we left the Chance Causeway all those years ago, I don't think, have I? No, no absolutely. No, brilliant. So, the idea originally was to put a family of four people on there. It was a boy and a girl and a mother and a father. And what we wanted to do was to have them uh, made up in gold and silver. This was a very sort of uh, spacey, sort of science fiction moment. I read a book called Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, and uh, at the end of that book, all the children of the earth disappear in this great ball of flame, and uh, I just thought it would be a fascinating sort of image to have. However, as you well know, because you were there... (laughs) The memory's faded, so so you can tell me all over again. Yeah, uh, it didn't quite work out like that. First of all, it was in the middle of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, So uh, initially we had a great deal of trouble bringing all our equipment and kit and makeup and everything else into the country but and we were stopped at various road checks on the way to the Giants Causeway. The second thing uh, really that was even worse was the weather. I'd imagine this shot um, at sunset or sunrise giving a wonderful red glow and beautiful Salvador Dali kind of clouds and you know a real (laughs) surrealistic moment. Of course, it pissed with rain. <laughs> and, and that meant that um, every morning we had to get up at about five o'clock and both you and Sam had to be made up uh, in gold and silver. We had a guy who used to do all the James Bond makeup. Work, Goldfinger. Course. Yes, Goldfinger. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Tom Smith was his name. We'd all get out to the Giant's Causeway. We'd all set up for this shot, but it was freezing out there. You guys were standing there. You and Samantha were there. And I'd be going, hold it, hold it. Don't move a muscle. That's fine. Tink with a cut No, just move a bit more to the left. And after about 10 minutes, everybody would be saying, get on with it. You know, God, we're freezing, you know. And your mother would be saying, get the children in. Then. Get pneumonia, you know. It was a lot of angst, you know, let's put it that way. <laughs> this went on, and then we'd do the same thing in the evening. Now, the third day, we ran out of makeup. <laughs> <laughs> so, unbeknownst to your mother, we set off uh, to find something else to use, and Tom Smith came back to me and said, the only thing I can find is spray paint, car spray paint. <laughs> In gold and silver. So he said, do you think they'll notice? I said, I hope not. So... What are you like? We got up the next morning and sprayed everybody with car spray paint. (laughs) And then your mother asked why it wasn't coming off in the bath. So anyway, so... uh, Anyway, what happened was, basically, at this point, the, the... the idea was falling apart at the seams. I, I couldn't go on doing this day after day, and the weather forecast was worse and worse and worse. Anyway, I suddenly realised that if you took these octagonal rocks and you cut them out as, as into shapes and you collaged them together, it meant I could photograph you two children individually on the rocks and then cut round them, cut round you and stick it together and you would never see the joins. Mm -hmm. And then we took the images back to London, we processed the film, created this collage and it all fitted together beautifully. Uh, And uh, I showed it to Led Zeppelin and absolutely loved it. Funnily enough, I showed it to Jimmy Page and Peter Grant, his manager, who were in all their finery of 
jewellery and, uh, and, and velvet trousers and high-heeled boots and sort of snakeskin jackets and stuff, standing in Victoria Station, and the artwork was in the back of my little mini. And they were ooing and ahhing about it, and, of course, dressed as they were in all their finery, gathered a crowd of about 200 people round. And when oh, I finished great. explaining how it looked and showed them the inside, which is also a beautiful picture, um, we got a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> but you're living with it years later. How do you I feel know. about it? Well, I, I mean, I, I find it sort of slightly terrifying, to be honest. I think because of what you say, it's a, it's a sort of strange army of children going up somewhere. And what worries me is right at the top of the, you know, right at the peak of this mound of stones, what's going to happen? You know, do, does the world end there? I was, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a particularly superstitious kind of guy, but I always wondered if, if there was something kind of... Twisted that, that that happens when they when the kids get to the top, um, and I guess there was because there's a blinding flash of light. And is that Nirvana or is that is that yeah, obliteration? Do you reckon? I've got to be honest with you, Stefan. Um, I think you're reading too much into it. <laughs> Are you surprised? Look at this. It's a nightmare no. vision. Hypnos- <laughs> hip- hypnosis, which was my company with Storm Thorgerson who who created this. We. Um, we did lots of album covers. We did all the Pink Floyd album covers, all Led Zeppelin's album covers, you know. And, and many times people have asked me, what does it mean? You know, what is the, uh, you know, dark side of the moon, the the pyramid shape with, with the um, sort of prismatic colours going into it? What does it mean? Uh, what was the pig over the power station with animals for Pink Floyd, you know? All I can say is that they were just designs that we did. There's no hidden meaning. We're not members of some strange Masonic lodge. It's none of that. We were simply designers, and I'd love to give you some deeper explanation as to what was behind it all, but I don't have one. <laughs> it's just a cool photo, is that what you're saying? I'm afraid to say it is, and if people think it's cool, I'm delighted. So... I'm leaving very soon to go back to Northern Ireland to revisit the place um, where the photo was shot, the Giant's Causeway. And I'm getting more and more anxious about this. Um, And I suddenly realised that I I really know nothing about Led Zeppelin. I I know nothing about the importance of of this album because I've avoided learning anything about it. I've avoided listening to it, Um, even though I'm well aware of Led Zeppelin's existence and how, you know, how big they are. So I've arranged to meet with um, Mick Wall, who is a legendary music journalist, to try and get a grounding in Led Zeppelin and try and try and give myself a a kind of a bedrock of information um, on which to sort of judge the album and, and what it means. Before Led Zeppelin, the whole idea of riding the motorcycle down the hotel corridor, the whole idea of feasting on 14-year-old groupies and spitting out their bones didn't exist. They wrote that rule book. Every group that now comes along and seeks to emulate that lifestyle is, in a very fundamental way, harking back to the Bible that Led Zeppelin wrote. Best of all, none of that would matter if the music they had made wasn't significant. So they were very highly charged and sexual albums, very ritualistic, very invocative, if there's such a word. They were intoxicating, in a way. Intoxicating, 100%. They were... Page told me that by the time they got to the fourth album particular track called When the Levee Breaks, which apart from Stairway to Heaven is probably the other monolithic track on the fourth Led Zeppelin album. He said the whole point of that was to make it like a mantra, or as he put it to me, hypnotic, hypnotic, hypnotic. Um, This album cover seems to regularly crop up in 100 greatest album covers of all time, and it's often talked about. Um, uh, I feel a bit remote from all that, to be honest. But um, why are album covers so important? Why, why are they such a, an iconic thing? It, it, you have to take it in context. By the time you get to the late 60s and early 70s, you have to remember this is a world with three television channels, one, one national pop station. There are no videos. We can't see artists the way we can now we can only imagine them 
And there very much was a culture of when I bought this, I literally took it away from the shop, sat on a bus to take me home, and the entire bus journey was about opening the gatefold sleeve, like opening a book, opening something interesting to see what's inside. Every, everything you bought in this package was significant. So when I put my headphones on and do whatever I'm going to do on Giant's Causeway, what, what, what's in store for me when I, when I listen to this, do you think? Well, I don't imagine it would be um, a small experience. I think just for you to go back to the Giant's Causeway with this in your mind would trigger some very deep stuff. If you're actually going to do this while listening to the music that this sleeve was meant to somehow represent, to somehow physically embrace, I imagine it will sharpen the point immeasurably. Um, I, I, I actually have no idea what's going to happen, but I think something will happen. I'll, I'll give you a bell, and in fact, I might give you a bell from there. And <laughs> on the Mick, mobile. help me! I'm losing it. <laughs> I'm not sure if Mick has put me more at ease or made me feel much more terrified about the whole prospect of revisiting the Giant's Causeway. I think what what really struck me from what he said was this idea about children. We were talking. We were talking about being a dad and, and looking at our kids and and the fact that we see our kids brings back memories of childhood and they're not particularly nice ones they're, they're, they're about the loss of our childhood and I wonder if there's something about this album cover that just reminds me of that of, of being on the verge of a much more complicated world Giant's Causeway. Um, I had intended to um, to come up here and strip off and, and kind of climb up this causeway um, as I did in the photo and try and rediscover my my innocent childhood. But um, there's quite a lot of uh, old grannies and their grandchildren pottering about, and I'm not sure I'd go down that well. So I just have to sit here. I've got the album cover in front of me and just looking at myself in it. It shows a little boy of four years old. And the connection I make is between that little boy and my two beautiful little daughters now, who they're four and five years old, and they are they're still simple, you know, they're innocent and and pure and and untainted by the the difficulties and the complications of the world. And th this picture is, is that moment. It's that moment of, of childhood. I, I kind of pile all my thoughts about, about those times before life became complicated into this one photo. And I, I <laughs> kind of... <laughs> you kind of desperately hope that your kids could cling on to that moment of innocence. That they could just hold on to that... that pure and simple time but it's coming to an end and maybe that's why this photo affects me so much that it's just a moment before the end of my kid's childhood childhood's end everything's going to be alright
really surprised. This is um, this is real, really upbeat music. I was, I was expecting some kind of monolithic, twisted rock freakout, but this is um, it's quite quite accessible. It's quite upbeat. It's got sort of happy stuff, isn't it? This is this is what I got from the cover. This is what I was expecting. I've been listening to this. The, the, there's a sort of hazy light that's uh, spilling all over the Giant's Causeway, and and I can't I can't get this image out of my head of this little boy just clambering up and down the, these rocks, having a laugh, and um, this the sort of lightness, this airiness of this song makes it all seem much tenderer, like a a note of optimism rather than the, the ending of something. I feel... I feel thoroughly purified. I feel completely cleansed. I really do. I, I, there's... It might sound ridiculous and new age nonsense, but I, a vast weight is lifted from me, and I can't really explain why or what that was, but, uh, but something is cleaner. I, I'm a cleaner person, having kind of, sort of conquered this bizarre, twisted image by coming, coming back here and enjoying it. Everyone's looking at me. I think I'd better leave. <laughs> Stephen Gates's cover story was produced by Russell Finch. It was a something else production for BBC Radio 4. The Expenses Saga and the Pope's intervention in the row over the Equality Bill. Up for discussion in the week in Westminster after the news. BBC Radio 4's Archive on 4. four. four. This programme four. will be brought to you four. by the number four. 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 4. Exploring 40 years of Sesame Street. They looked upon the show as an experiment. It's going to be a terrific show. It was as if the world had been waiting for this. From its influence to its controversy. I would be worried to see it for an hour every day all through the year. Part of the aim was to produce something that would be entertaining to adults and also entertaining and educational for children. Open Sesame. Oh, clever title. Yeah, I wish I'd thought of that. Archive on 4, tonight at 8, repeated on Monday afternoon at 3.